I want to try and sort of set the scene a little bit this morning of both what's happening uh, in the legal sector, why, and what challenges and opportunities it creates for law firms. Because I actually believe that firms reposition themselves both for good and bad much more in a flat market than in a booming market. In a booming market, you've got to try very hard not to do well. Um, and quite frankly, we've had a 25-year boom market, give or take a year or two, until this downturn. There was a view, I think, in 2009 that this is going to be a tough year. We get through this and we cut costs and we do various other things. 10, you keep your head down, and 11, we will recover. Some of you may have seen the chart that was in the FT um, last week, I think last Wednesday or Thursday, which um, tracked the various recessions through the 20th century, from how long it took to get back to the levels of production we had at the start of the downturn. The longest of those, I think, was in the 90, I think it was the 90s recession, which was four years to get back to the top. Even the 30s was only about four, four years itself. We are now into our, I think, 30, uh, about 32nd month, technically, um, and the like, we are still a good four or five percent down on where we need to get to. So this is likely to be a long recovery, so firms that are waiting for a return to normal, I suggest, will have quite a long wait. I think the important thing to bear in mind is that GCs are pushing back, and they have done, and they've used this downturn very effectively. But I think it's also important to bear in mind a couple of things. Before the downturn, they were probably some of the worst buyers of legal services in the world. And we benefited from that as a profession. Um, now, it's not that they've suddenly woken up and want to be beastly to their law firms. They are under intense pressure themselves. We do some work for, in, for general counsel, and we did a review of one legal department of a FTSE 100 company. As part of that, you normally interview a range of the lawyers and a few people in the business lines that have direct access to the lawyers, and then make some recommendations. Within our first uh, two weeks of being engaged on that project, we were asked to have one-to-one -one meetings with the CEO, the CFO, the COO, and the deputy chairman. That gives you an idea of the profile that the legal department and how it operated had within that major organisation, and an idea of the pressure that particular general counsel was under. I also talked to one other general counsel last year, and he said, I just wish my law firms got it. He said, I had a meeting recently with the CEO and CFO, and the CEO said, look, I want you to cut your internal headcount by 10%, because we're doing that across the organisation. I want you to cut your external spend by 20%. I want you to spend more time with the board and be more strategic. I want you to head off the litigation. Oh, and by the way, you're effectively now our chief reputational risk officer. Just think of that. The CEO left and the CFO said, well, I echo all of that, but you're actually bloody awful at managing your budget. Your quarterly budgets are nearly always exceeded and you've got some great excuse. Let me tell you, from now on, if you bust budget for two consecutive quarters, please don't worry about it. We'll just get a new GC. So bear in mind, that's really what's happening there. So they're not prepared to just listen and say, hear from the law firms, this is all quite tough. Um, inflation's been 5%, can we have a 7% increase? Which is, quite frankly, what we got away with through the 80s and 90s, and very successfully. Um, they want people to come up with more innovative and, yes, cheaper ways of billing. Again, firms have got to understand the impact of cost overruns on both the GC's budget and on the profitability of a business. But I think one of the very important things to appreciate is that many GC's are actually open to a much more sensible and a much more collaborative approach. It's not just a matter of beating the law firms around the head. They are looking for firms that will suggest ideas, will come to them, um, not necessarily send them lots of irrelevant brochures issued four months after the relevant law has changed, um, but will come to them and say, we've been thinking about you, your business, whatever. Now, that may mean that for, for the first time, law firms actually have to have 
a serious R&D function. Again, something we've never had to think about before. I think once a business identifies a cost um, that can be adjusted, it will be. And some of those adjustments will be in various ways. A number of legal departments, for example, are looking at what work they send out. Can we do it more efficiently inside? Can we use legal process outsourcers? Can we use different firms for different types of work? But that is all in the game now. And if the GC isn't doing it, him or herself, they're having the procurement team sent in to help them. And uh, that's just a reality. I think also we've got, with um, like many of the larger corporates capable of uh, analysing legal bills in a much more scientific way than the past. In the past, perhaps, a general council looked at a bill and thought, well, that's, that's OK or not, and passed it for payment or had a discussion. Now they can analyse what time was spent on that and they can compare it across firms for different similar projects and similar types of things. So those are the challenges and those are challenges which are clearly not going to go away. I think the other thing that we've, uh, we're working through, and this is a much greater challenge I think for law firms, to some extent some of the cost cutting and adjustment that was done in 2009 was really about preserving the existing law firm model. And now I think we're at a stage where we've got to look at that model and say, actually, is it really fit for purpose going forward? Is it really appropriate to have the same people doing the really high level negotiations and a lot of the grunt work on a matter? Is that good for them in terms of career development? Is it good for the clients in terms of cost? I'm afraid general counsel have woken up to the fact that even in very complex matters, a significant amount of the fee, in many cases over half, is actually on much more routine work carried out within that. That's a challenge because that's potential, that potential unbundling of work, that potential reallocation of work in different ways, is going to have a major impact on the financial model of a law firm. Actually, in many ways, we've been able in the past to massively overcharge for a lot of routine stuff, but actually in another way have ridiculously undercharged for our real rocket science work when we've really been doing it. But how are law firms going to respond to that? Well, I think we've already seen. We've seen some making arrangements with um, lower cost providers in other locations. We've seen people looking at LPOs. We've seen a number build their own process centres with both um, uh, Herbert Smith and Alan Overy moving to Northern Ireland. In the States, a significant number of US firms have developed that, again, within the US, but in lower cost centres, where instead of being in New York and hiring a first year associate at $150,000, you can go to other smaller cities and get them for 60. I think, actually, it also produces one of the great challenges for firms We've tended to use IT quite badly in law firms up to now. I've described IT in a lot of firms uh, as not actually fundamentally changing the way people work, but actually automating the quill pen, in that we've done the same systems, we've just done them a little bit better using IT. I think we may have some quite significant changes on that, and IT is enabling that as its cost comes down and its capability dramatically improves. So I think there will be some very important issues there. But also the whole quality of the, um, of the gene pool of a law firm is going to become increasingly important at all levels. Where they are, where they're based, how motivated they are, how excited they are, how you get them up to the appropriate skill level as quickly as possible. So whole issues around training, development, HR will become increasingly relevant as firms become far more streamlined. And clearly in this age, the challenge will be for the firms that have to invest in these sorts of things, how much of that is to stay in the game and how much of that will we have to pass on to our clients, how much of that will we be able to trouser ourselves? I think the very simple answer is we don't know, but looking at other markets, ultimately, as people change, a lot of the benefit gets passed on to the client in the end. So there may be a, some first mover advantage for people that change their models first and don't have to pass so much on. For those that are last mo mover, movers, they'll be playing catch-up and passing all of it on. 
There is a limit as to how firms, far firms can cut costs, not to say there won't be another round of cuts, and I think there will be within the next three months or so. Um, but actually, this is also now about how do we reorganise ourselves and how do we get the clients, how do we grow our market share. And in a flat market, brutally, you grow market share by stealing it from others. And if you're not stealing it from others, they're stealing it from you. And it really is as stark as, stark as that. Um, one thing that I asked a lot about at the moment, and a lot of my clients are international firms, um, globalisation, I, I must say, I feared that with the downturn that would come to a grinding halt. If anything, it's accelerated. Um, and I think that's partly because not just the UK legal market, but the UK and European and to some extent the US markets are pretty flat at the moment. A lot of clients in those markets see their growth in Asia, in um, Latin America, in Africa, in very different markets. And they're saying, well, how are you going to help us in those markets, or are you just going to wave us off at Heathrow? Um, it's quite staggering. We have seen, over the last three years, more office openings in exotic locations and more mergers involving law firms internationally than in the previous 10. And that's just the beginning of that sort of process. Um, the, another thing that li is linked to that is the client demand. The clients are quite significantly reducing the size of their legal panels. And they're also requiring the use of on-panel, not off-panel firms, much more uh, rigorously than in the past. So I think firms are increasingly concerned that if we don't have the depth of practice, both in practice areas and in geography, they may, may miss the cut. And we've seen firm corporates over the last five years or so move from perhaps four or five hundred um, accepted law firms, possibly down initially to a hundred or so, and in many cases now down to 50, 30, 20. And there's a trend that's seriously continuing there. Bearing in mind those really large clients that will account for a hell of a lot of fees, there's probably only three or four thousand of them in the world. And how many law firms want to be on their core list? So it's going to be challenging. Um, some we will see, as I mentioned, some more law firm merger activity. We will see that if only to, defer the, um, to reduce the cost per partner of inter further international development. The challenge when your profits are subdued is you've got a much smaller investment pot, whether to spend in IT, whether to spend in new premises or laterals or teams or new offices. But we will see winners. We will see, I think, there's no doubt about it in my view, we will see the three billion pound law firm. We are seeing the magic circle and those about pushing their way to a one and a half million pet. Um, we're seeing others that are pushing up. We're seeing a significant number of other firms stagnating in the middle. Um, and the challenge there is to make sure they keep their best people and keep them motivated. Because what is clear is that the big boys are getting much more aggressive in that if they see something they want, they go and get it. Um, but also, we're seeing it domestically. Um, I've been involved in a few, um, or I, sorry, I am involved in a few potential domestic mergers at various stages, whether to create new top 20 firms, whether it's firms uh, lower down the lawyer 100 looking to build up critical mass to reduce costs, to grow market share, whatever. Still challenging, and it's been a bit slower than I thought, I must say, but I think we'll see a significant amount of that in 2012 and 2013. So I think it will be a challenging time for those of us operating with law firms, but I think there's a great opportunity for change. There's a great opportunity for firms to reposition themselves, to really know what sector of the market they want to service, to service that with passion and focus, and really to win in this. So for those with that clarity and with that ability to execute, I think the future is very bright indeed. Thank you. I think you'll find around the, the, the board of most law firms that there's a an awareness of what needs to be done, 
but, but there's a difficulty in executing. In my experience, uh, I've been quite surprised by how few firms have, A, really thought about what ABS, as for example, <coughs> means, have really actually engaged and thought through, well, what is uh, going to be the market implication of ABS, but also how could that work for me? Uh, what's the relevance of this in, in the market that my firm operates in? The small firms are having to be a lot more nimble, and, uh, and I think, especially if you look at what Tony was saying in his mm. presentation, the, the pressure is at the lower end. I think the, the bigger firms have the, uh, the, the infrastructure, the, you know, the strategy departments, people to, who actually spend their time thinking about the problems. And, and small firms have the ability to react more quickly, uh, and you know they tend to be less profitable. And and that you know cri crisis is a great motivator for change. <laughs> <laughs> the small firms may be more nimble, but my concern is, do they have the right people then to be able to help them through the sort of changes? In the in the medium term, is the biggest challenge facing all of us. I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly to make the point, but the kind of career paradigm for a lawyer has been qualified each year you get a whacking great pay rise and then after a few more years you get promoted and a few more years you just earn more and more and more. So you have got a whole generation of people in the industry being brought up on that and what we're suddenly having to say is there's not room for people to keep going up. Actually there's feed pressures, we can't keep paying you more money. Demand and supply of lawyers, there's more and more lawyers, there's more and more substitutes so logically the remuneration for lawyers should um, flatten or, or even go, go down. I think a challenge for um, law firms at the moment is actually to look at their internal structures quite critically actually and say what level of resource do they need at what particular level to do the work. The interesting lot are the people in the middle and I think those come into two categories and probably in the past you might have looked at some oh, they got no ambition they're not very dynamic they want to come in and work nine to five we don't really want those I, this is a question. I wonder whether you actually do want more of those to create a stable organisation. The problem you've actually got, the people in between, they're quite dynamic, quite ambitious, but not good enough to be the top. <laughs> I think that the law firms that are likely to succeed very well in the future are those that blend the skill sets, yes. uh, that are using the skills of you know, senior management, wherever that comes from in terms of qualification background, to help make sure that the firm really develops into the future.